15 minutes of discussion, we will have to cut it to 12, in fact, because of the extension. And I will be doing that in this session because we are really pressed for time. So we have about 12 minutes for discussion. Go ahead. Please. Moving presentation, it, it uh, brought to mind the discussion yesterday from Dr. Schellenhuber of the Nansen passports. Based on your last slide, should we consider in our declaration uh, urging countries individually and collectively to develop that new architecture for the humane, generous, and tolerant handling of refugees during a century when we uh, face the prospect of a lot more refugees? The conditions in the camp are uh, dystopic at, birth, at best and inhumane at worst. The data on rape, the data on assault, the data on um, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, the studies from Greece we commissioned, the studies from Africa we commissioned, all reveal a very consistent picture. And that is the camps are not uh, immigrant children, half of all refugees today for the first time in history are children. Immigrant children need a place to grow up. They need a place to be safe. They need a home. Anna Freud did the famous studies in the Hempstead clinics of the refugee children that were being savagely bombed during the war. The most important finding from those studies in London where that children in an environment that has predictability, that has normalcy, that has uh, the rituals of life, above all, education. And Madame Vokova from UNESCO wrote a beautiful paper in our book for this, uh, on this topic. It's what is needed. So the camps are hiding the camps are places of limbo. The camps are uh, not human spaces where children can flourish. When the Greeks first thought through the idea of education, it was based on the concept of eudaimonia, flourishing. The children in the camps are withering. They're not flowering. So yes, we need to step up. The United States can take every child that is being forceful to this place in the three biggest conflicts today, and it wouldn't be a blip in our radar demographically, culturally, socially. Okay. Now, uh, congratulations, Marcelo. Fantastic uh, and very worrying, uh, worrisome uh, data. My question to you is about where is the best uh, investment that we could call for? Which is it to to deal with the, uh, uh, the the problem or try to to address the hard question of the root causes of of this massive migration? Uh, especially uh, in the in light of the military actions uh, in in Africa and in the Middle East, which are so terrible. So, isn't that what we should be speaking about? You know that these military actions are the source of a huge part of this problem, in addition to climate change as well. Yes, just quickly to add on to something that Howard mentioned a moment ago, there's a kind of an irritating concept that's circulating right now um, in the in the uh, sort of uh, immigration uh, research community called hospitality. 
that sites that take in immigrants should become hospitable sites. And I don't think that concept goes far enough. So if there's any sort of declaration, it has to be a much more integrative concept that these receiving sites become homes and that immigrants become full members in, particip in participating in the life of the, of the community. Because as we know, and it's not acknowledged, I think, widely enough, you know, climate change was a, a threat multiplier that produced the, the political conflicts in Syria. Okay, so cities that, that take in climate refugees need to become more hospitable. And that's a, that's a planning issue, not just simply a, an ethical kind of, you know, uh, red card. Very briefly, yes, I, I agree with you. And uh, Virgilio, I do think that uh, all wars of choice, and this is a statement that uh, Jeffrey made in our gathering in Los Angeles, all wars of uh, choice are uh, inhumane and illegal, and they are uh, catastrophic in the aftermath. Uh, also, of course, the, um, uh, the true north here is sustainable economic uh, <coughs> development and the opportunity for human beings to pursue their, their love and work at home. The data are over, uh, overwhelming on this, over a century. Uh, about less, between 2.5 and 3% of the world's population will move at any given time. It's the punctuation of, an equi of the equilibrium in terms of the self, in terms of the society, and in terms of the environment that creates this extremely explosive disrupt movements. Human beings are uh, the children of immigration, but they're also the children of uh, place. And uh, again, 2.5 to 3% of the world population will move. It takes a tremendous shock to the system to m m make a, a migration a massive uh, movement with catastrophic consequences. You have to work very hard for that. Most people will stay put in their own homes if possible. Something is not working here. Okay, now, now we go to the following one. Uh, there, notice something here. We have two presentations back to back. One is uh, five minutes, and the second one is uh, five to ten. Right, and the second one is twenty minutes, so far as I see. And then we have only fifteen minutes of discussion for both of them together. Okay. So let's try, ve try very hard to keep the timing because if not, the discussion will be gone. So next, I'm sorry. Oh, intervention. Oh, I, I'm following the program with Melissa Farley. The Melissa, yes, of course. Oh, well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Okay. So right now comes uh, Dr. Melissa Farley Executive Director of Prostitution Research and Education, and the topic is Climate Disruption, Denial and Prostitution Harm Denial. Thank you, <clears throat> and thank you so much for squeezing me in. Resource extraction is the business of exploitation of the earth. Prostitution is the business of sexual exploitation. Both must be eliminated in order to sustain the existence of women and children. There's a relationship between how the land is treated and how women are treated. In, 156 uh, in a study of 156 cultures where sexual violence was minimal, the earth was relatively free of exploitation and destruction. And when there were high levels of sexual violence, there was significant environmental degradation. When there's a boom market in fossil fuel extraction, prostitution increases. Pimps traffic women and girls to boom sacrifice zones like the Bakken oil fields in North Dakota and Montana in order to pacify men who are themselves poor and exploited. And when the extraction ends, the prostitution remains. Prostitution is also linked to the longer-term 
destructive consequences of climate dis disruption. The most severely impacted are those already vulnerable because of their poverty, their sex, and their ethnicity. Regions severely impacted by climate disruption are especially vulnerable to exploitation by sex trade pimps. Prostitution is a form of violence that generates financial gain. 90% of those in prostitution want to escape it, but 84% are controlled by pimps and traffickers. They're coerced into prostitution by sex inequality, race inequality, economic inequality, and increasingly geographic inequality. The emotional consequences of prostitution are the same in widely varying cultures, whether it's high class or low class, legal or illegal, a brothel, strip club, massage parlor, or the street. Symptoms of emotional distress in all prostitution are off the charts. Two thirds of women, men, and the transgendered in prostitution in nine countries met diagnostic criteria for PTSD. This level of extreme emotional distress is the same as the, emo as the most emotionally traumatized people ever studied by psychologists, battered women, raped women, combat veterans, and state-sponsored torture survivors. Please don't be fooled by those who tell you selling sex is like any other job. Some words hide the truth. Just as torture is named enhanced interrogation and logging of old for growth forests is named the Healthy Forest Initiative and climate disruption is named extreme weather events. So also prostitution is named a, job, a, a choice, work like any other job, a victimless crime, or from Backpage.com, we offer a wide range of personal meeting and relationship opportunities. These pimp messaged slogans are good for business, but there's no evidence supporting them. Paid for AstroTurf campaigns controversialize the facts and generate fake criticism of peer-reviewed articles on prostitution. A doubt-inducing in playbook is used by denialists of both climate disruption and prostitution harms, and I've included a handout from an article that's forthcoming. There's an ideological synchrony in the business of exploitation by sex and the business of resource extraction. The supremacist attitude of the old growth clear cutter is kissing cousin to the sex buyer's entitlement to sexual access. In prostitution policy, the free market fundamentalist, George Soros, is what the Mercers and Koch brothers are to climate policy. They promote decriminalized pimping renaming pimps business managers. The same rationalization that's used to exploit the land is also used to exploit women in prostitution. But we're creating jobs and they're making good money. This argument suggests that the money disappears the harms. Another perspective is that the money coerces the harms when people are struggling to survive. A forced choice between poverty and pollution should not be government's only options, and a forced choice between poverty and prostitution should not be women's only options. Thank you. <laughs>